What's up, Tweener? It's welcome back to another Tweener Tennis video today here on the channel. And today we are not in our regular spot. Today we are on the road. We are at, for those of you that are following us on social media, we are at Michigan State as of today because we are doing a feature on their program. Shout out to Harry and them for allowing us to be a part of it. But today's not about that. Today we have Ben Rothenberg, former New York Times writer and now author of his latest book, Naomi Osaka. We reached out to him to talk about his new book and what it was like to get to know and be on the grounds about learning one of the most infamous athletes. Ben did an amazing job with this book. I hope you guys did read it. And if you haven't read it yet, click the link down in the description below if you wanna check out his book. We've been reading it. We're not yet done, but so far we have been pleasantly surprised with everything. So listen to our interview with former New York Times writer and now author Ben Rothenberg from his latest book about Naomi Osaka. Before we go, make sure you are subscribed to Tweener Head Tennis. We're trying to hit 5,000 subscribers this year. and would love to have you guys join the channel. So over 90%, yes, how is this possible? 90% of you that are coming back to watch these videos are not even subscribed. Would love to have you guys join the channel. Let's try to get that down to like 80 possibly 50 we would love to have you guys join so make sure you are subscribed leave a like comment down below of what you guys think of ben and his latest book and naomi for that matter now enjoy our interview with former new york times writer and now author ben rothenberg ben doesn't need an introduction those who follow tennis and those that listen to tennis or talk about tennis know who ben is from his writing and i think the biggest project that Ben has accomplished right now is his Naomi Osaka book. And we're going to talk about that today on the channel. So we appreciate Ben taking time out of his day, especially being in Australia to be here with us. So Ben, welcome to the channel. First time. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Phil. Appreciate it. No, absolutely. I'm again. wearing my, I'm um, good to see you too. I appreciate that. I'm wearing my Osaka sweatshirt. So I felt like it was just to wear this and mm -hmm. we got to start with what made you one, choose now to write a book and two, why Osaka? I wanted to write a book for a few years just to sort of have a different format and medium to sort of pour a lot of the, the stuff I felt like I'd acquired and learned in terms of just acquired wisdom and, and no, my, emptying my notebook kind of from having Carly Tor for, for a little mm. over a decade. And so I'd wanted to do that for a few years and kind of wish actually I'd started something during the pandemic when I was home like all <laughs> that time. And so, but right after the pandemic was sort of easing is when I had the idea or when I finally got the deal to do the Naomi book. And Naomi uh, was a a person who been I've known for before, potentially before she was on the top hundred. Actually, mm -hmm. Courtney, my podcast co-host uh, and NCR, was at her first tournament in WTA tournament in Stanford in 2014. It was at her press conference wow. there, and they immediately messaged me. You know, you'll, get, you'll get to the front of the book soon, where it's like where she messaged me and said, "Like this, you got to listen to this audio of this of this player who just beat Sam Sosa out of nowhere," and was really. <laughs> Uh, this remarkably different personality and obviously a great player as well with a lot of raw potential anyway at that point and yeah. so i followed her for a while and then just knowing her as this like really profoundly shy person and this person mm -hmm. who was very timid in a lot of certain ways um seeing what she did by winning a couple of grand slams reached number one obviously and especially in that 2018 us open final which was hugely tumultuous yeah. and then while still being shy and then but also what she did during the summer of 2022 sort of finding her voice this is in the subtitle of the book you know she uh found this way to use the platform she acquired in this way that was really surprising. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, defied a lot of expectations and showed a lot of growth and evolution and also invited new challenges and new, new pressures for her as well. Uh, so it was around the 2020 Cincinnati tournament, the one that was held in New York during the bubble mm -hmm. there, that uh, where she stopped play for a day that I think she really sort of came to focus as someone who was really kind of the the main character, if you will, of this of this yeah. of the sport in in that time. And it stayed that way. It stayed one of the main characters at least ever since, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and and I as I started thinking about her, I realized how little of her story was actually known in terms of her origin, mm -hmm. in terms of her family, their motivations, her childhood, because mm -hmm. she really had kind of come relatively out of nowhere on a sort of mainstream media level uh when she won the 2018 US Open. And yeah. because of everything that all the controversy in that match around Serena and Carlos Ramos, the chair empire like that was this huge, uh, enormous trampoline of attention that she got um, that would have not been that if she just won like, you know, the US Open final against, uh, you know, some other player uh, yeah. and without all the drama, it would have been nice, but it would have been, been a big story in Japan for sure, but it might not have had yeah. big resonance worldwide and certainly in America that it exactly. wound up having for her 
winning and just being seen as a sort of positive part of this otherwise really ugly scene. And yep. so it just increased her notoriety and her her household name recognition, I'm sure, immensely then. Um, but yeah, but I didn't feel like there was really sort of the 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 storytelling or the research or the reporting to sort of make fill in the gaps, especially once mm -hmm. she became a more talked about person herself, mm -hmm. you know, circa 2021. This is even after I first had the idea for the book, but she was so such a polarizing person around like the 2021 French mm -hmm. Open during yeah. her standoff about media conferences there. And yeah. and so I felt like she was so talked about, but I still felt like fairly little understood was known. in terms of her. Yeah. Yeah. In terms in terms, I feel like people were there's a lot of like a lot of width of the conversation about her uh mm -hmm. breadth and, and range but not much depth so i was trying to add some depth and some, some insight to this to this project yeah and i think for you too when you first started looking at naomi and you first started the process of this book like you said even during covid we talked about this before we started recording of the process of just starting it and you have an immense amount of notes over the years of covering her and understanding who she is as a not only as a player, but as a person as well. How do you, what was the first step for you to say, okay, how do I get started? Because someone that obviously hasn't written a book like myself, I, I don't understand mm -hmm. the process of what it's like to start or the concept of starting an idea. There's always that. But then yeah. what was what was the first step for you kind of saying, okay, I have to do this. And now we begin the entire process from the beginning. I'm not going to pretend like I had a really smart strategy for this is my <laughs> That's first fine. too. So that's fine. I felt like I was learning. I've learned a lot of things the hard way during in the process of, of sort of organizing my time and, mm -hmm. and stuff in this book. And, and that I would love to apply those hard earned lessons to another book someday. But yeah, yeah this time, one of the first things I did in terms of research is I went down to Florida actually and okay. went around uh, Broward County specifically a lot mm -hmm. and a bit into maybe Palm Beach where she had been training as a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. with various different coaches uh, throughout her childhood and and around public parks usually in in around that kind of Broward County area which is like Fort Purdue like Fort Lauderdale kind of north mm -hmm. of Miami yeah. uh, big still still very heavily populated area but not quite downtown Miami but a big part yeah. of the general metro area of southeast Florida where a lot of people live there and there's a ton of tennis there too it's a real tennis yeah. hotbed uh, you know some big name places like the Chris Everett Academy are there and Rick Macy some other mm -hmm. big academies on the west coast of Florida as well, like ING and, and yeah. uh, Saddlebrook. But uh, East Coast Florida, South Florida in general is a huge tennis hotbed. That's where people kind of go to chase chase their dreams for tennis. And mm -hmm. and so yeah, talking to those early coaches and getting a sense of of their parts of stories that hadn't been told. Um, mm -hmm. Naomi has not talked, and Naomi was a kid then, so she's not always the most. Uh, and she wasn't. You know, it's different. Adults have different memories of things and have different ways of explaining things. That as a journalists you probably need to talk mostly to people who are adults while things are happening in order to get yes a, 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 a certain kind of perspective on things and so yeah finding those adults and they were all uh you know able to find them and went to various public parks where pretty much all of them were still working and and, and teaching tennis and some of some private clubs and stuff and one mm -hmm. of them, kind of their own academies of various different scales and different levels of uh, sophistication but mm -hmm. yeah so I went there a few times and got a lot of notes and talked to them and got a sense of what the family was like their motivations you know what sort of got them there and that was one of the sort of first foundational trips I did to sort of fill in, fill in gaps. But then, yeah, I mean, I was working on so much of the book all at once, all the time. And there were so many, I knew there were several flashpoints in her career mm -hmm. that I was going to have to talk about for sure. Like most, I've mentioned it already, but like most obviously by the 2018 US Open final, mm -hmm. it's been a huge scene of every, all the controversy there, the 2021 media situation mm -hmm. at the French Open, her 2020 uh, Black Lives Matter activism in New York during uh, those two tournaments there back to back. All those mm -hmm. things were going to be big parts of it. And so I was trying to, Talk to people while well, also mm -hmm. still knowing that Naomi was still a growing, moving, evolving target. Because I started doing yeah. this book, I officially started doing the book late 2021. And okay. so I was on the tour in 2022, shadowing her. I was planning to basically go every tournament she went to. And I did that for the first half of the year and then faded out a little bit. But she was also not playing very much, too. So yes. she wound up having a really unremarkable year results wise. And her ranking slipped from like, I think 13 ish to 40 something in during yeah. that year. And, and it just was, and it was, a, and she was really kind of directionless by the end too. So that was the challenge. And also just sort of not knowing, I had to write an ending for this book at some point, not knowing really where she was going and everything. So okay. then a couple months after that, uh, in terms of just timing, because the book was originally also going to come out in August, 2023. So she announced okay. uh, she was pregnant and that she was going to, and she was having a baby around, around July of, of that year. We, we, we kind of figured that out. She didn't say that in an original announcement, but we figured out when the baby was coming roughly. And so we decided, yeah. this, you know, Wanted to, and she also said that she intended to come back in Australia in 2024. So yeah. 
pushed the book release back, back by uh, four or five months, which was honestly a huge help for the writing and reporting process, giving myself okay. that, giving me the extra time to make the book better. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it would have been as good a book for sure in terms of having wow. five, four or five months. That's a huge amount of time to, be yeah. able to make something deeper and better. So uh, yeah, so that was, that's all worked out well. And it's come at this really sort of natural, I think, inflection point or bookmark or book, yeah. bookend kind of section of her of her life chapter break whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. so yeah i'm happy with all how that worked out but it was definitely a lot of uncertainty and a lot of trying to figure out which pieces do i need to sort of uh, uh accumulate what, in what order do they go mm. all those sorts of things and i think for you too as as an author that writes about someone that's currently playing not someone that's retired we know naomi takes breaks from time to time um mm -hmm. big advocate for mental health and just having a baby having time off things within that nature when you write a book about someone that's still on tour and you had those four to five months all kind of pushing it back when you knew she was going to come back during this time. Did you add anything to your book or was it more revision based where you had to look over? And like you said, you made the book better in that aspect because you had more time to look at it, tweak it, make it more your own voice and tell the story of Naomi that's still on tour. What, what was that four to five, what did that four to five months do to help you, either add or make the book better in your own eyes? Yeah, I was still working on various different parts of it. I had, you know, it was kind of, I wasn't working on it from start to finish in any sort of real logical order because there were always, I was doing inner, in just the reporting process, I would find people in relatively random orders. Like one of the first, one of the last actually rather interviews I did around the people I found was a person who was a friend of the Osaka family when they were in Japan. You would have read this chapter already probably about their, one of their friends who was another Haitian guy who had come yeah. to Japan sort of following her father over there uh, which mm -hmm. is like hey Japan's great it was Japan uh, essentially and so yeah so so that was one of the first, so that was like the second chapter of the book basically in terms of their origin but it was one of the things I wrote last so or okay. one of the couple paragraphs from from that guy so it was it was not in a uh, in a real which made it challenging too that I always felt like every chapter some chapters were pretty like you please subscribe thanks I could sort of close the book on and, and move on like something about like yeah. what happened in the 20 years of and final during the match yeah. that was okay I can watch this match very closely document what happened and 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 seal that but a lot of the other mm -hmm. stuff in terms of finding out different parts of her story or her personality or whatever it may be those are always things that I could always sort of uncork and, and mix mm -hmm. some, some new ingredients into any general and dish that was being there uh in terms so in terms of new stuff during the extra time I was still yeah mostly just wrapping up what I had been doing okay and and also I wrote like an epilogue, obviously that, that was definitely new in terms of like how the, basically the epilogue to everything in 2023, like how baby news affects her, how she finds her motivation again for tennis, her rehiring with Bissette uh, to work for her again and and setting up for the rest of her career. So that, that was all obviously pretty, that was one of the things I wrote last, obviously. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was uh, an interesting thing. Yeah, but just a lot, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a pretty lengthy book. Uh, yeah. Not, but word page wise, uh, mm -hmm. even though it's a, I don't think it's a especially slow read. Hopefully for people, I think people. It's not. Started, it, it. It's so easy yeah. to read, and from my experience, and we have to thank Ben and his publishing company to thank for allowing us to read snippets of his book to have the book now oh, sure. and read it. And uh, for me, it was like it. I want to say easy read, but. With you present, I want to use a bigger and fancier word, but that's just not easy, who I am. Easy, I like, easy, read. I like e easy, quick, breezy. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, yeah. It's like, I think that, like, I think that her story, honestly, and this is one of the reasons people ask me sometimes why I picked Naomi other, over other players. Her story is so action packed and her story has all this, like, yeah. natural highs and lows. And, and it's a character arc. Drama, it's like, for lack of a better word. Like, yeah, yeah. There's, there's just like, a, the, the plot keeps moving. It's pretty propulsive, her story, yeah. once you get into it. So, yeah, and, and I and it's a long but it says a lot of detail in it, but I think at the same time you go to pretty everyone who I talked to has read it so far, which is only you know a little over a dozen people at this point, probably. Yeah. Uh you know, it just came out. Uh yeah. It says once they get started, they go really quickly through the book. So it and, and not, you don't want it to be a chore. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what makes it a good read because how easy it is to read through it and hear your voice and hear the description of what of what you're trying to talk about too. And for someone and I may get ahead of myself here because I haven't read the full book yet. But when okay, you yeah. when you write a book about someone without having a sit down one on one with them to 
besides doing interview and press, besides not having that one-on-one interview about a book, about a player, Mm -hmm. how challenging do you find that when it comes to writing a story about someone based uh, without even talking to the person you're talking about? I was talking to her. I mean, I, I definitely was not like, there are some people who write biographies, uh, you know, who, who don't who never met the person mm-hmm. who, who from really from a distance. And that was not my experience. With, I, I mean, I'd known Naomi for a while. I was in constant contact with her team. Her okay. 2022, I was like, I said, I was on the, I was on the tour at okay. however many tournaments she played. I think all but like two of them that she played okay. two or three in, in 2022. So I was with her around her a lot and her team. Okay, great. So I never felt like I was really at a distance and there were lots of questions that, you know, I had about the book in various times that I would find ways to ask organically. Like a lot of times yeah. it would be, I can say like, you know, for, and I would get questions sort of offline, you know, stuff too. But yeah, there were times when, for example, like if she was playing, I know I can think of one example, like she's playing Belinda Benchich, I remember in Miami in the, in the semis, I think. So before the semi, I was asking her about like other times she played Benchich, you know, cause she played yeah. Benchich at a, at, she lost her at a couple at a grand at the US Open one year and she lost to her, or she played her at a very early term in 2013 when they were both teenagers. And it's this like yeah. very pivotal moment in Naomi's career where she get where Branch, which is a highly had a junior. Naomi's mm-hmm. kind of a nobody. It's definitely a nobody. And Naomi gets a, a win over Benchich and it becomes her calling card very early in her yeah. career that she beat Belinda Benchich. Yeah. And so I was asking her about that match, you know, and she was, you know, she knew all about it. She was happy to talk about it and stuff. And it was still in the context of her playing Benchich in the next round in Miami. Yeah. So yeah. it was, it was very useful for the book and she knows that. She knew she knew I was working the book the whole time, and she but she was never okay. She was never uh, what's the word for it? She was never like especially cagey or elusive or in the or in the dark be, with it or trying not to give you. Or like, or she, wasn't, she was never she was never trying. She was never trying to do anything to to hide stuff. That's kind of naturally who she is. Too. She's such okay. a fun intended that she you know she can she she shares what she's thinking and, and she's she's always very generous and open and that's just her natural personality. And which, yeah. can, which can, you know, be tough for her at times when things aren't going well, that she does sort of doesn't put walls up at certain mm-hmm. points. And that can be that's part of why when things were not, when she was feeling a lot of stress in 2021, why she uh, decided that press conferences were something she wanted to to mitigate mm-hmm. or try to uh, remove from as one of her stressors in that moment. Mm-hmm. But generally, yeah, she, but generally most of the time, people she knows, especially like she's known me for a long time. She's known a lot of the sort of core tennis people who were around on tour covering women's tennis, especially yeah. not all the our reporters pay a lot of attention to lower rank women players mm-hmm. a lot of times but people who who had been around her paying attention for years i think she felt pretty pretty uh, comfortable with and and for you too how much how much of the book did you have to go through with her team with Stu, with them what was their what was their thought process of when you first introduced it to them and their team with hey i'm gonna write a book about your player like what was that yeah. what was that experience like dealing with her I'm not going to say entourage, but with her entire team, what yeah. was that like? Yeah. I mean, most of it was through Stu, who's her agent, who's really her her main person who yeah. oversees everything as her partner and all sorts of business stuff. And it's not a big operation, her team. I mean, her team, because she yeah. once she left IMG, uh, which they did in the middle of my writing this book, uh, which didn't really affect it too much. But uh, but they, yeah, they had, you know, I was in contact with Stu a lot. Stu was always sort of the point person generally. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes we checked in. And, and the fact that you know, when I told him about the book idea early on, he was open to it. He said, yeah, sure, it sounds like good she, he knew that Naomi didn't want to write her own book anytime soon that was not something she was interested in okay. so that was not like a I knew that was not like a competing project from her which is a possible concern writing a, a book oh, about a figure like her mm-hmm. so that was that was good to know and then also yeah that um yeah that they weren't they were not antagonistic towards the book at all they were never trying to like you know which some people are be obstructive to the book so that which mm-hmm. definitely can be the case for some subjects but they were not that way which I'm grateful for and then yeah the fact checking sort of get to the end uh, mm-hmm. uh that was yeah, i had a long call with with Stu going over like all sorts of new details in the book that had not been published previously anywhere before okay and a lot of the stuff then also on her early life especially because before Stu got there and Stu did have to check later stuff too but like naomi went through a whole list of things herself too and like wow said yep yeah, that's right that's right that's right this is not exactly how that happened here's how that happened and like some small clarifications nothing that she like totally said was completely wrong but like a couple okay which was i appreciate too because it showed that she was paying they showed she was paying attention to yeah absolutely you know that's not quite how how i wound up going on that trip or something whatever it was like it was it was small stuff a lot of stuff that she was clarifying um and mostly you know 90 90 percent of it was just like check yeah 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 yeah, 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 along the way so so that was really great to have her personally Mm -hmm. 
involved in it, just as a journalist to try to make sure I'm getting everything as correct as I possibly can at all times. Uh, that was definitely would not have been possible without her and her team's uh, mm -hmm. cooperation on that. So like yeah. I've gotten asked, people ask or some tweets, like why isn't it like promoting the book? Like it's not yeah. his book per se. It's like, not it's her not book to publish. It. She, well, she, well, she could, if she wanted to talk about it and maybe she'll get asked about it in press, I don't know what will happen with, with that. And that, I'm, yeah. not gonna, I'm not gonna ask for myself, but if someone else wants to ask about <laughs> hey, it. Hey, what do you think about my book? She, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, she. We'll see. I don't know how she'll respond to that, honestly. But, um, but she's you know she promotes stuff that she's in business with, and she has so many different mm -hmm. business ventures. You know, there's all sorts of different yeah. partnerships she has and 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 products she's selling at any given time. So she's not yeah. doesn't. I mean, she also never you know shares like newspaper articles or stuff written about her mm -hmm. generally too. So it's not different than that. Really, it's just a bigger scale thing mm -hmm. available in a different medium. But in terms of the actual kind of work I do and the journalism I do, I think it's very much in keeping with the sort of style and tone of. Mm -hmm. A lot of my New York Times stuff that was on mm -hmm. my main writing, obviously for ten years on tour, mm -hmm. but just obviously a very different scale of of the of the breadth of the depth of the length of the project. Yeah, absolutely, and and I kind of wanted to touch upon what you said earlier when you went down to Florida to find out more information when you when you do that side of journalism and you have to kind of go to the ground to find out the information. What do you think the hardest part about that was for you when it came to going deep into her younger life and understanding what went on and how did you find information like that? That wasn't the toughest part. Well, I mean, I don't think it was the toughest part of the whole project, but that was one of our satisfying parts too. Just that, like, you know, as a reporter, you're like going and meeting people who haven't been talked to a lot. A lot of these coaches, you know, there've been like, maybe like there was like one article in a local newspaper in 2019 that kind of is like here, like you might not know this Japanese player spent a lot of time in Florida here mm -hmm. are some of the coaches she worked with then, which was actually very helpful for yeah. telling me a lot of their names versus a resource and some other people who were involved in, in Florida tennis, including, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Jim Mars just passed away. And, mm -hmm. and there's a few other people, uh, there who, you know, it's a, it's a relatively small network of people, small yeah. world in Florida and tennis generally is a small, tennis world, is small, pro tennis is small and everyone knows everyone. I'm always amazed. I see like two random players, even like an ATP and WTA player, like together in the hallway, some tournament or waiting for, you know, their cars to show up or something. They'll always have, have often, depending on their personalities, if they like have anything in common, they'll like have lots of friends in common. They'll know who to talk about. They'll know like what gossip is going on. Those all sorts of different friends, you know, ask mm -hmm. where they're vacationing. It's a small world. They all know each yeah. other. And, and in Florida tennis, it's the same way. So it was able, people could talk about other people or at least give me contacts occasionally for each other, for different coaches mm -hmm. and stuff. So that was appreciated. Yeah. And that was, and that was just nice to get a sense of, of that part of the, of the sort of production lines are going essentially to the farm rather than just being at restaurants all the time in my career. Yeah. So I went seeing these like finished products at, mm -hmm. at tournaments and they're in the competition mode. Uh, but, so, but very rarely before this had gone to many like academies or anything like mm -hmm. that. I've been to, you know, uh, it's just not part of a lot of my reporting process. I need to write about mm -hmm. kids and, you know, parents at this level. So going down and seeing that and seeing the sort of energy of the people there and sort of trying to be able to describe the mood of these academies and, and the ambition there, what keeps this, these places in business and, and what motivates the coaches and the parents mm -hmm. and the kids alike, it's just all sort of interesting. It's from an anthropology sort of level to, to mm -hmm. try to appreciate this, this interesting ecosystem down there. It can yeah. be, and a lot of people talk about it, like it really is a very kind of cutthroat jungle of, you know, of, of, of a place. Yeah. Where people, everyone's ambitious and there's limited success and, some people are going Everyone. to make it, but most yeah. people will not make it. And yeah, it's, and there's, there's it's a, a small hierarchy percentage. which academies are better than others. And yeah. And so, so that, it's really, it's really a pretty brutal world down there. Yeah. As much as it is like sunshine and palm trees and tennis courts, which might seem like a, it seems a like resort. a great idea, it but really it's usually a rough place. Yeah. yeah. Especially tennis parents. And we all know that. And I think you, mm -hmm. you said briefly that that wasn't the hardest part about writing this book. What was the hardest part about writing this book? Honestly, I think it was just more on like, this is kind of more boring writing, but just like getting it all organized and getting everything uh, compact and keeping it moving, mm -hmm. like the pacing, which again, I am very happy with in the end, how the book is, is pacing, but mm -hmm. that was a, a struggle throughout and just sort of just projecting how long the book was going to be. The book was, I probably cut, I don't know, 15,000 words worth of the book, honestly, from the final, from one of the final wow. longer rough drafts to make it, and it's still long, but like there, there was a lot more in terms of different tangents and a couple Mm -hmm. uh, sort of sidebars that I that I cut and which I you know liked a lot of and maybe we'll find mm -hmm. a home for some of them someday. One of them mm -hmm. actually is a chapter that was on Ash Barty's retirement, how that sort of affected and oh and really that's awesome. Naomi and women's tennis that that actually I found a uh, a 
Australia magazine that ran that a couple weeks ago. So that was nice. To That's awesome. Monthly. Congratulations. Yeah, sure. If you want to look for, thank you, the monthly Ben Rothenberg, whatever, Ash Ashbury, there's that's on, I swear it's online. That shouldn't be paywalled or anything. So you should be able to find that. And okay. yeah, so cutting like that. And then also trying to find these huge cultural moments for Naomi, like mm -hmm. notably the 2018 US Open final, the 2021 French Open, and, and the aftermath and, and you know, huge uh, echo chamber of that afterwards, mm -hmm. trying to make those enormous flashpoints into sort of manageable, digestible uh, sections mm -hmm. was yeah. also a challenge, just because you could write both of those moments, really, you could write individual books about and they could fill oh, the yeah. book. But, uh, uh, yeah, but trying to make them just a part of the story, even if a big part. But yeah, that was it. That was a challenge as well. And and for you, I actually was curious, did you talk to her parents at all about the book or ask for or ask Stu if you can get in contact with them to talk about certain things? Or was that a different topic for her? Uh, Stu does not manage the parents. So I was I was sort of more on my own going to the parents there. Okay. And her sister too. I had another member for immediate family. Mm -hmm. uh, Mari, I talked to the most of the rest of the family. Um, less so to the parents ultimately. Um, but okay. I had been, I had known her father for a while and her, mm. her, she had, he had been, uh, well, he'd been on, when I first met her when she was 18, he was traveling with her and she was obviously mm. kind of a kid. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that was, uh, nice to see them, uh, or not, sorry, that, that was helpful to, to have known them a bit. And her mom, uh, her mom had just had a book out too, which you've read the early chapters. So it was a few times yeah. I was quoting from her mom's book that's in Japanese. And so that okay. was a great resource as well. Um, so book and her mom wanted to sort of, didn't want other books wasn't you know she was very polite about it, but didn't want to be too involved in my book because she just had her own book come out about, yeah about well that makes sense stuff too so she kind of her own project yeah she had mm -hmm. her own project on that front which is fine but her, her book was a huge resource and i got everything uh i felt like i needed from from that so that was that was great so yeah so it was um yeah i think i think and especially mari mari comes through a lot i think mari's some of the sections there's you probably haven't gotten to any dedicated mari chapters yet but okay mari is this really interesting sort of parallel uh you know uh i don't know you call it like token on the game board or whatever that's probably a terrible analogy but something you see this this, this an important piece on singing. the chessboard yes yeah but also also almost more like sort of like they these two things that are starting on the same track but one of having these different outcomes or just say their roads diverge at different points Naomi and Marie, right they have all the okay. same beginnings and they're starting at the same point but they have different power ups or setbacks that each hit yeah. along the way in terms of just okay. basic things like now we want it being like six inches taller than Mari and physically stronger than her and yeah and and things like that you know different genetic stuff that can happen mm -hmm. and you see and you just see the difference in their careers obviously now hits number one and Mari peaks at 280 yeah. know, in the world which is kind of below getting into grand slam qualities even that's below you know a lot of different cutoffs where people think it it means to be a successful tennis player a lot of times and so yeah. seeing yeah how how they had these similar childhood, similar ambitions. Their parents have these similar same dreams for them. And one of them is wildly successful and the other one is not. It's this mm -hmm. interesting sort of dynamic of getting to see sort of both of the sliding doors moments in their lives of like mm -hmm. how it could have been either way. So I think Mari uh, kind of keeps that that reality of, of how, how a long shot this tennis dream is. Mm -hmm. I think pretty grounded uh, alongside Naomi's story of wild success. Yeah. And I, and I think for her too, I think we all know those that follow tennis it's probably the hardest sport to one make a living out of and to constantly make a living out of it and not just have one successful year because you have to be successful all the time and for you too when it came to understanding Naomi and learning more and more about her while she's on tour and following her almost for an entire year essentially that she's been playing what what was the biggest misconception that you tried changing about people's mindset about Naomi when you wrote this book? Or was there something that you were trying to tell your audience about Naomi that people didn't really fully understand? I don't know if there was one thing that I thought was the biggest misconception per se that I was really trying to mm -hmm. overturn or to change. I don't even know. There, yeah, I don't necessarily think there's like here's what you have wrong about Naomi Osaka is not mm -hmm. really the tone of the book so much. It's more just trying to be a lot more complete about her. And to okay. sort of, and she's a complex person. She's with a very full life and a lot of different forces. And she is very polarizing, mm -hmm. you know, as far as a lot of sort of circles where she's seen, you know, certainly along kind of predictable political, social, cultural lines. So there's this division of people who are sympathetic to her and, and not sympathetic to her about her various uh, struggles and times and sort of 
and yeah, trying to humanize her, I guess, um, mm-hmm. is, is a big thing and just understand more depth about her life and everything like that. And so there's there's not um, yeah, there's not really one thing that I would say I want people to take away and learn, but just getting a more complete picture of her. Mm-hmm. And that comes through a lot of details for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But in this moment, there's no like one telling detail that stands out. I do think I do think that the book gives a pretty clear picture of how much the family really uprooted their their lives mm-hmm. and, and and to focus on this tennis path and how much they were really going all in, you know, yeah. in a poker sense on on this on this dream and, and the sort yeah. of risks of that and the the payoff of that on a level obviously too. But yeah, just a sort of very um risky uh, yeah. road they took in a lot of ways. That's definitely mm-hmm. a clear thing. And I think that can inform uh, how people should should can understand Emma as an adult. And what yeah. sort of experiences she had that shaped her. Yeah. And I think when you talk about Mari too, even in the first two chapters, you don't realize how much of an impact she really made. We know they're close, but Mari was kind of the defining factor of Naomi seeking therapy. And, mm-hmm. and even though that's like a weird thing to say, or maybe not necessarily taboo, but one thing that many people don't talk about, but Mar- Mari was the defining factor for Naomi seeking help outside of tennis and i feel like not yeah. many people know that yeah and mari wasn't around very much a lot of time during nami struggles but seeing nami struggle up close because she was at that 2022 20, indian wells tournament just the openings for a chapter of the book yeah because um, it was one of the most i think they telling moments that happened while i was on tour with nami that year um mm. it's, the, it's the biggest flashpoint the biggest so that's why i started the book with that and and yeah and, and mari was the one who was able to sort of get through to Naomi because Naomi often can be very stubborn and very um hard to to pierce the armor of sometimes and just sort of mm-hmm. puts a wall up around the people she knows and but yeah but Mari is the one who's been consistently able to to pierce that it I the Pokemon line really got me in like the first <laughs> that that was probably the best I honestly when I read that I was like I had to reread it to make sure I read it right too with how she wanted to be the very best like no one ever was. And I can't believe I just remembered exactly. that off the top of my head. And and, and yeah, it's true. You got it. And she's and she's close to being or maybe is considered one of the best as of right now in the modern era and not named Williams to she, play. One stat, I've, one stat I've used a few times is she still has at four, which is still a huge number. I mean, people, the scales yes. are broken by the big three, but four is still a lot. It's still more than any other man or woman born in the 90s has won. She is still the most of yeah. any player born in the 90s at four. Sean yeah. Tech is born in the 2000s. It's also at four now. Um, well, that's but that's still in, that's still weird to think about that different. she's two th- two thousands yeah. and she's won four. That's still wild yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah, that's no, she's wild, she's man. incredible. And but yeah, but Naomi of her generation and of the sort of people, you probably expand it a little bit from people born from like I don't know 88 to whatever, the year before she got to this war, basically. Uh, she's one of the most of anyone in that sort of 12, 13, 14 year range, whatever yeah. that would be. So basically between between Djokovic and, and Shianta. So uh, birth wise. Yeah. So yeah, but, she, but she's broken through in this time when not many people were, and she's still not done. You know, she yeah, has ambitions. Absolutely. I think she's playing really well currently. We, currently and and wouldn't count out her adding to her total. She wouldn't, you know, she said, she said out loud during her, her paternity leave or pregnancy leave that she wanted to win eight more Grand Slams, which was a sort of staggering goal to state out loud. But also, but that's it, it amazing. Obviously, she does anything like that. But and she said she's she said it's better to sort of aim high and not quite get there than sort of count yourself out. Is what she said later. That's true. That. But but she yeah. But she said. Uh, but but anyway. But objectively, her winning one more Grand Slam would be an amazing feat. Because so it's also just been so hard for for women coming back from maternity leave to win. I mean, we saw what happened with Serena and not coming so close and not getting there. And Azarenka has not gotten there yet either. Well, Kim, Lots of well, cases. It's very tough. So best Kim case. Kim did, but that's, but yes. she's. But that's different. So far. That's different. Yeah. Um, I think. It uh, isn't, it isn't. I mean, Naomi I mean, I mean, has yeah. the same coaches as Kim actually had at that point with Bissett and, and she's around the same age Kim was roughly when she came back. So she wants to have a Kleister's type comeback and we'll just see how, how that goes. We don't know. Oh, 100%. And I, Ben, I can't thank you enough for being here. I also asked, wanted to ask you one more question. If you could sure. write a book about any other player uh, on tour or not, who who would you want to write about? And there's so many different stories, honestly. Like, And mm-hmm. it's also different, like, cynically, like, in terms of who my fantasy book would be and also, like, <laughs> what people would buy. You know, yeah. it's, those are not necessarily the same answer at all. Oh, they're like, definitely not the same answer. 
definitely not the same answer. And so Nami is this great combination of being genuinely fascinating to me and also being someone who publishers believe the market would care about, mm -hmm. you know, and people will be interested in. And so that yep. was a great compliment. That is not at all a factor, uh, not at all a given for a lot of places. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. So there's a lot of like smaller stories of people I would love to to write about. You know, I was actually was just thinking about and I don't know much about her life at all. It would be fascinating to see how this would be a totally different book, but like Shacey Way just like played her last singles match. Yes. Uh, the Australian Open Qualities just, just yep. yesterday here. That would and, be a great one. She's just such a, such an odd, different, like beautifully strange person and, and player. Yes. It's sort of it, unlocking her story would be very cool. I don't think it would sell almost anything in the US, but, uh, or maybe it maybe would be big in Taiwan. I don't know, but it, it, it that was like the kind of thing like in terms of like a book just for like my own satisfaction i would love to mm -hmm. write you know a, a story like that and then a lot of the you know bigger stories too like Djokovic in his own way is super fascinating mm -hmm. on the men's side he's kind of the obvious you know grand slam count leader now like he, yeah. he, he'd be more obvious choice for a book and he's super complex as well if you wanted to get there's also a different way to go with the Djokovic That's book like, and there could be a lot of very different very valid Djokovic books written there probably will yes. be someday. Um, I, yeah, I'm very excited a, to see a, that line of on books. the opposite scale of, of yeah yeah on the opposite scale of like uh, obscurity let's say from or quirkiness from from Shesue, I would pick uh, Djokovic is sort of obvious answer there, there's benefits to doing both I think you just named the two most polar opposite people if you could write a book, <laughs> Sue Shea and Novak yeah. Djokovic. Those are two it, weird, yeah, weird, but, that, yeah, but that, it's but like fantasy versus six, that's what like about tennis. You know, there's yeah, exactly. different people and individuals in tennis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the whole point. And Ben, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I'm very grateful for you allowing me to read some of your book. Uh, I can't wait to see what else. Yeah, please, you have the whole thing. Please read the rest yeah, of you want I, to. I would love to talk to you more about it too, if we had a chance. Um, enjoy your time in Australia. I'll leave a link in the description for you guys to go buy the book. Uh, do you want it on the website or Amazon? I'll give you a choice. Oh, well, the website just links to other link I use links to other retailers. Amazon's great. Any other small bookstore is great. Just wherever people get it is great. Honestly, I'm not too picky about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, Perfect. You can just get it. just buy the book where you can also like request it from your just buy the book. Yep. Hardcover is great to buy in terms of like physical copies are slightly more helpful for sales. But also there's ebooks, there's audiobook now, which I thought audiobook yet, now too. That's true. The audiobook yet. So I, but I hope it's good. Um and yeah, looking forward to more people reading it and kind of continuing the discussion about it going forward. Because I feel like I've been talking a lot with this thing that people <laughs> it's been a very one-way conversation about it. So hopefully I'm now excited to hear what people have to say once they dig in. Oh, 100%. And Ben, thank you again. Make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and make sure you go check out Ben on Twitter. Definitely has a lot more followers than I do. But nevertheless, go follow Ben for a good read. <laughs> and we really appreciate it, Ben. Enjoy the rest of your time and enjoy Australia. Thanks, no worries. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric.